welcome uh, dr mumbi uh, i am so glad that finally i could get hold of you and uh, and and you could spare time for uh, this interview what we are trying to do actually is to get a host of uh, people across the world to talk about uh, the most important aspect that everybody wants to hear at this point of time which is immunity and how to increase your immunity through diet through lifestyle changes and through uh, non uh, pharmacological methodologies and and i mm. think uh, dr mumbi you are the most perfect uh, scientist physician alternative doctor truth teller and seer i would say that that could I tick all the boxes, don't I? <laughs> Shouldn't be boastful, but you know, I make it my business to be yes. as accurate and honest as I can. Let me say, Sanjay, it's always a delight talking with you. I just love being with you. Your company and presence is very soothing. Thank you very much. So nice of you to say that. Uh, I'll just introduce you for a minute, and then we'll I'll have a few qu small questions which uh, we can answer in a brief way. And ideally, we'd like to keep it around thirty thirty-five minutes because then it gets you know too long and people don't have the attention span i i think i agree yes the world is going that way isn't it mm -hmm. you know when we were raised and went to school and so on, we could study for two hours at a time now it gets past 15 minutes they're twitchy and fidgeting and wanting the next cup of coffee it's terrible <laughs> data overload on our brain is so much now yeah. I'm afraid that is essentially the case, isn't it? And, you know, the, the internet provides all this information, but information is not knowledge. and People don't get that. You know, they think if I have more information or more information, I know more. And it's not true. You can have mountains of information and not know anything. I mean, look at the US government right now. <laughs> They've got access to infinite amounts of knowledge, but uh, infinite... <laughs> okay. So... Uh... Uh, I would just wanted to introduce you, uh, Dr. Mumbi qualified in medicine uh, in 1970s uh, as an MD in Manchester and he immediately began research into the alternative controversial side of medicine. He also started the first successful food and uh, environmental allergy clinic in London. Uh, in 90, by 1990 he was known as Britain's number one allergy detective. He published several books in this area and has been interviewed by BBC and many other TV and radio stations worldwide. He is now recognized as an expert in alternative health paradigms. He lectures worldwide internationally speaking on themes of energetic medicine and new anti-aging science. He has written a book called Virtual Medicine and many other books actually. I've lost count of how many books he gave me when, when I went and visited him. <laughs> he has also written a famous book called Dietwise. And, and I will, of course, ask him a few questions about that. He's also a founding member of the British Society for Clinical Ecology, a medical advisor to the board of What Doctors Don't Tell You. He's also a scientific and medical advisor to the British Society for Homotoxicology. And uh, many other, uh, I, I, can, I can go on and on about him. But let's, let's get down to the, you know, the crux of this interview or this discussion. And, uh, uh, and my gratitude to you, Dr. Mumbi, for sparing this time. It's a pleasure, as I said, Sanjay. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Fire Dr. away. <laughs> yes. You've been an expert in studying allergy for years now. And, and my understanding is that when COVID-19 stuck, you must have processed it, uh, handling in a, in a better way, I mean, theoretically speaking. What is your interpretation of the current crisis in terms of the body's response to an external allergen? which is your area of specialization actually yes well all right Sajid, let me say something very clearly which is there is a virus it's a strange virus you know there's a subset of people who are thinking oh because people are dying and it's a strange way of dying it seems to have emerged that this is a very unusual funny virus but you know is it vicious is it deadly is it you know beyond control and beyond measure so that we've got to react so violently and honestly, all the statistics point to the fact it's relatively mild. We think the, ultim the, ul the ultimate death rate is, uh, uh, is dropping and dropping because more and more people are being found to have the disease, but they didn't die. You know, I mean, they're faking the deaths, let's be honest. They're counting almost anything as a COVID death, but you know, somebody has to die to count that as a death. So there's only a finite number of deaths, but the more people get tested, the more we realize it's already endemic in the community. There are many, many cases of this. So in other words, it's not really a very virulent organism. And therefore this is all over, 
overreaction. And you know, the one thing that expert, government experts, um, um, well, there's, there's two things to say about that. One is the government is not really listening to doctors and scientists, to computer programmers that are doing prediction models and they're actually listening to doctors like me but i mean there are many academically high up doctors currently in employment at university that are saying hold on you know this is crazy the one thing that everybody seems to be ignoring and you know we have an immune system hello you know the immune system is there to protect us now there have, have been deadly diseases in the past the black death you know tuberculosis was pretty evil historically people died but that was mostly because the immune system wasn't engaged properly you know, i mean tb has been a fantastic killer over the centuries but the number one predisposing factor to tb malnutrition you know people just don't eat well mm. they're often poor people so they haven't got the food and there's one other thing we will be talking more about later but you know shock and distress so the the, uh, the novelists you know the victorian novelists and jane austen and this they had it they understood it that people you know they'd be plighted in love and it was all a big tragedy and the next thing is there'd be coffee blood and within two more chapters they'd be dead you know they understood it beautifully so it's what we really need to be doing is not looking at extreme physical measures to try and prevent the virus moving around what we need to do is find the very best way to tune our immune systems up high because no matter how deadly i mean let's you know take ebola which is an awful disease dear god i wouldn't like to get that about 80 percent of people will die but there's 20 percent that don't so what's the difference the answer is their immune system is capable of battering this virus to death so that it goes away and in COVID-19's case, you know, most people have an immune system that's up to scratch and they're not succumbing. They're, some of them are not even having symptoms, some are mildly ill, and only a very small percentage actually get sick or even uh, proceed as far. And we do know that that group of people are already sick. You know, we know there are predisposing factors. Modern world factors sanjay like you know obesity and diabetes and somehow it alters the lining of the blood vessels that this is where covid 19 strikes they thought it was a respiratory disease it isn't the way it affects the lungs is by clotting the blood vessels of the lungs so the person is able to breathe okay but they go blue because they're not performing an effective exchange so you know we it, 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 to, to beat this disease we've got to have an immune system that's there doing its job as it should do and i know you want to talk in depth about my you know my long suit as it were hello <laughs> yeah yeah you're so, gonna have to cut that out <laughs> you thought you'd frozen up <laughs> yeah okay so uh can you hear me now Yes, yes, thank you. You have also spoken a lot about uh, inflammation and anti-inflammatory foods in your books. And, and, and obviously, at this point of time, when fear, anxiety, stress and traumas are taking over our minds, uh, whether whoever is playing up with it, I don't know. And I don't want to comment on that right now, but because that's a very controversial area. But somebody is spreading fear and anxiety as a business. And, and that is actually lowering our immune response. And obviously, the way you have addressed it in your books is is a lot uh, of anti-inflammatory foods that you talk about. Right. What recommendation do you have for people to 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 change their diets or nutritional programs to introduce anti-inflammatory foods so that they can bring down their inflammation and thereby enhance their immune system? Uh, this is a very very good question and one of the most important questions in all of medicine. Sanjay. We, we eat foods and people, I think people think naively about food. You know, food nourishes my body. Therefore, foods are good. Foods are lovely. Foods are wonderful. But they're not. An awful lot of them are seriously toxic. And some of the everyday foods are very toxic. Uh, my old mentor, Richard Mackinus, pointed out that if cabbage, for example, had to go through tests for fitness for human consumption like drugs do it would never pass <laughs> and and on your continent you know this the condition of uh, 
Latharism caused by overplanting Latharis beans. I don't know if you, how many Indian people know this story. I'm sure doctors do anyway. But you know, they get Latharism, which is paralysis, because it's the chickpea plant is very poisonous. The Latharis bean, I should say, is very poisonous at the end of the day. It's okay because we cook it, and it's okay because we don't eat it often. But when crops fail and people plant only Latharis bean and eat it and eat it and eat it, then it becomes poisonous. Mm. And, and so many foods are toxic like that. But the point about allergies and food allergies, Sanjay, is that this is an individual reaction. Clemens van Pirke, the Austrian pediatrician that first defined allergy, said it's acquired, specific, and uh, unique, right? Now, acquired means you don't, you're not born with it. You know, you develop an allergy to something. And usually the, the reason is you keep meeting it. And the more exposures you get, the worse reaction you get. Uh, it, it's uh, specific, meaning only to certain things. So you can have a severe reaction to tomatoes, say. Notice I'm saying tomatoes, even though I was born and raised saying tomatoes in Britain. <laughs> but I've lived in the US for so long now, I'm saying tomatoes. So you can be really ill with tomatoes. I mean, I had a guy who carried a bag of tomatoes home and ended up wheezing with his asthma. And he realized just from that one thing, that the main contributing cause from his asthma was tomatoes. He didn't even eat one. He just had this thing hugged to his chest as he walked home. But yet be perfectly all right with potato, which is in the same food family, or eggplant or aubergine, same food family. So it's a very specific reaction, and, and it's unique and personal because not everybody has it. You know, this man reacted severely to tomatoes, tomatoes, <laughs> but not everybody does. I love them, I eat lots of them as far as I know, I'm fine. Uh, so that's really the, it's an acquired process. In other words, it's not typical, but it can be very severe, mm -hmm. very severe, Sanjay, and people don't get that. I had a boy who uh, used to react to carrots. He had epileptic fits. When he came to see me, we found carrots were causing that, but not just carrots, the whole family of foods related to carrots so there's there's dill parsley celery celeriac and a whole bunch of foods that are related directly related to carrots they all look the same you know the bit above the ground is all fluffy and feathery similar looking plants and it's a food family he was very ill with that family but that was only the one if you stop that family no more fits no more drugs and that fits my definition of a cure which is no treatment is needed and there's no disease process left anymore. That's a cure. If you're taking drugs for life, it means by definition the drugs aren't working otherwise. If they were working, you'd take them for a couple of weeks and done. <laughs> you know that doesn't happen. But yes. the common pathway of all these things, uh, Sanjay, is inflammation. And that's really the, the undercut of all diseases. It's the undercut for a, the aging process while inflammation is running in your body. That's a severe disease anyway, and it can strike in any way. So even cancer, you know, people wouldn't typically think of cancer as an inflammatory disease. I always did kind of intuitively, but it was interesting because a paper came out a few years ago when they showed that this is how cancer works. It sets up inflammation in the surrounding tissues, which then become non-functional, they're inflamed, they don't work as they should, and then the cancer can move in. Very, a very cunning process. But it's behind all, you know, Alzheimer's, heart disease, you know, aging processes like arthritis, these are all essentially inflammatory diseases. And of course, a virus or an infection or a bacteria, you know, streptococcus or I mentioned TB now, these are all essentially inflammatory processes too. So we're into a very important medical principle called overload. You know, some viruses, some lack of sleep, some food allergies, uh, you know, too many, uh, too many beers one night and it overloads and something will break. And the thing that breaks is the key to the symptoms. If the skin gets inflamed first, you end up with skin rashes. If the lungs get inflamed first, you end up with asthma. If the brain gets inflamed, it can, Sanjay, it can be almost anything from, you know, depression, mania, hallucinatory states, schizophrenia. Yes, even schizophrenic states can result from, from food allergy. Uh, we call these the target organs, and it means it's very diverse. But the thing I'm putting my finger on is actually the overload factor. So if we improve our diet and stop eating 
junk and garbage and toxic foods like colas and sugary food. I mean, sugar's the worst inflammatory substance known to man, in my view. If we stop doing that, then that reduces the burden on the immune system quite a bit. So it's very helpful. You know, if you've got the virus and you're eating well, and you're probably not even more in the diabetic and you're eating junk and starchy, sugary, garbage foods, you might, you might regret it. You might end up ill or dead. So it's a, it's a crucial factor. But the key is overload. So we have to somehow reduce overload on the immune system. Yes, you talked about the overload in your book, uh, Cancer Research Secrets, and in which you also talked a lot about the uh, vitamin C, and vitamin C is now the underdog of uh, COVID-19. It's really become so important that, uh, you know, people are taking 50,000 uh, mg of vitamin C a day in IVs uh, to, to treat this. And you've spoken a lot about it in your book, uh, Cancer Research Secrets. Right, yeah. Vitamin C has got to be one of the most wonderful substances that God gave us. In tiny amounts, it will stop you dying of scurvy. I mean, microscopic amounts, like 100 milligrams. And yet you can take 100 grams, that's 100,000 milligrams, and it won't hurt you. In fact, uh, a famous uh, US physician called Frederick Klenner showed us it could save your life. You see, what happens when a person is severely ill, their, their vitamin C levels drop. Now, we need vitamin C. It's a very potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. On those grounds alone, it would save you, you know, if you suffered a, a severe illness, let's say a septicemia or a pneumonia, vitamin C saves lives. You need large quantities of it. But as I said, it's so wonderfully tolerated. It's unbelievable that we can take all this amount. But yes, it's, it's probably one of the most potent antiviral substances. And I don't mean it kills viruses. It's not that. It kills the cytokine storm. You, I think everybody's heard of this. This is what kills people with diseases like sepsis and pneumonia, and COVID and um, Ebola. All of this. Ultimately, there's a, a wild inflammatory response. Substances called inflammatory cytokines are released by the bucket load and it literally kills the person because they're highly destructive and highly inflammatory. Well, what vitamin C does, and some other vitamins to a certain degree, okay, you know, vitamin D not, not the least, but number C is the outstanding one. Vitamin C will quench all of those free radicals and will quench the inflammatory reaction and bring the cytokine storm down to the point where it's tolerable. You know, it's no longer a storm. It's a bit of a drizzle on a, on a wet day, <laughs> but no longer a storm. It's wonderful. And you know, it's dirt cheap. It's one of the cheapest substances on the planet. You buy bucket loads of the stuff for a few dollars uh, and you can walk in. I mean, if you go to the pharmacist and buy capsules, you're paying 10 times the, yes. the real uh, value and sales rate. But that's fine. It's convenient. But you know, the, the intravenous vitamin C, it's, Yes, it's dollars on the I've been taking pennies on vitamin C IVs almost every week. Uh, Excellent, good for you. Uh, and on a daily basis, we need to take a lot, but of course, that's a problem, as you know, and as most of your doctor friends will know, it, it causes bowel intolerance, you get belly ache and diarrhea. Uh, and I've solved that problem actually. I've developed a special vitamin C, which is a, a combination of EDTA, ribose, vitamin C, a couple of other things. And it's actually well tolerated. Um, I mean, there are other people now doing this. And of course, liposomal vitamin C, it's much better tolerated. Liposomal, not so much, but the point is you can get more in. So one gram of vitamin C is about the blood level equivalent of 10 grams of taking it orally. Uh, my, my other solution is the other way. So you can take 50, 25, 30, 50 grams orally, providing you use this non-inflammatory version. So raw VC is uh, it's not that well tolerated, but it's very safe. You know, the worst you're going to get is diarrhea. And, you know, we're, we're holistic people, aren't we, Sanjay? So we know that diarrhea is, is not, it's not a disease. Diarrhea is the solution. <laughs> if you get diarrhea, it means your body's chucking things away. That's always a good sign anyway. So it's not really a problem. Never stop diarrhea and never stop vomiting because it's the body rejecting things, basically. They even yeah. say you get fever once or twice a year. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, all that keeps the immune system tuned. 
But, you know, listen, we've got to take, you give me the, the key now, the, the cue. We've got to talk about hygiene hypothesis, haven't we? The, the best way to have the top rated immune system that can do its work is to train it and pra make it practice, make it do things. Now, at the moment, we're, I don't know what's happening in India, but in Europe, we're running around, everyone's washing their hands, and, you know, sanitizing. It's called like six, eight, ten times a day, quite apart from the amount of chemical you absorb, which your poor old liver then has to deal with and quite apart from the fact that it's poisoning the microbiome on your hands because you know we have a microbiome on our hands microbiome in the mouth microbiome in the vagina the, the genitals these are all different to the intestinal microbiome but they're still very important to protecting us from immune system training I mean, how crazy is that? So, you know, kids that run around in the dirt and, you know, pick up a piece of dog poop and say, what's that? It, people might go, yeah, but actually it's probably developing a very strong immune system for that child. You need to meet some contamination. And of course, nature in her ultimate wonderful wisdom does everything you need. When you're born, you, you know, you slap out a, a mama's a vagina in a pool of shit and urine and things, which is exactly what the baby wants. I think nurses should, you know, scrape some of it and rub it in the baby's mouth because that mama's microbiome is the strong safety element that you've got. It's not dangerous, you know, eating poop isn't dangerous. Rabbits do it all the time. There are certain animals trying to do that to get a second digest of the food. It's just disgusting by social convention, but it absolutely is not unhealthy. Yes. <laughs> and that reminds me, by the way, have you come across that site called The Power of Poop yet, Sanjay? <laughs> it's well, a layman's site. Doctors are horrified, but it's a layman's site teaching uh, fecal transplants. You know, eat shit or do your own or get it from some healthy friends. Yes. Uh, I don't want to go there, but, you know, it's uh, know. honestly, it's healthier than running around sanitizing your hands 10 times a day. <laughs> a lot healthier. My immune system loves meeting germs and I will not. You know, if somebody says you can't come in the shop unless you wash your hands, I will turn around and walk out. If it's somewhere I want to be, like a nice coffee bar, I'll say, I'm not doing that. But if you like, I'll go in the toilet, wash my hands. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't mind doing that. I will not sanitize my hands. <laughs> Rebel, always a rebel. <laughs> also in your book, uh, Diet Wise, you know, you have also spoken about uh, people... Uh, all the, the, the same diet does not work for everybody. Each of us have to discover what suits us and what does not. For each of us, the diet is different. And, and uh, a lot of people who are talking about the same thing insist upon doing a very detailed and expensive uh, microbiome testing and then identifying a diet that suits your microbiome. But your book does not recommend very expensive microbiome testing. So how does one really go about, I'm not asking you to summarize the book in one sentence, but in general, what is your guideline that uh, it helps people to identify what are the foods that they should be eating and what not? Right. Well, first of all, let me tell you, I consider the science that says, well, test your microbiome and that proves you should eat these foods is a hoax. There is just not the science to support this dream idea. It's a delusion. The, the ultimate, the, the problem with food allergies, Sanjay, is there's no golden benchmark test. You know, you can do skin testing uh, the, the, the scratch and prick test don't work anyway for food but there is another kind called miller's method i used to use it a lot uh, even the eat it and see test which seems obvious you know am i allergic to bananas well i'll eat a banana and see doesn't work because of this important phenomenon called the mask to allergy now I, I haven't time to go in great depth about the book but basically a masked allergy is something that you're eating so often you never really notice any effect. And in fact, sometimes you might have a symptom on the day you didn't eat it. So it can be quite complex. You know, a person will say, uh, you hear patients, for example, say things, well, I can't be allergic to milk. I say, I've eaten it for the last three weeks and then had a single migraine. But it could be the cause of their migraine and the reason they haven't had them is because they're feeding on milk every day so they're keeping the symptoms at bay you know like a like a heroin addict is keeping the symptoms at bay you know a heroin addict doesn't do it because they like it they do it because they it's awful when you don't do it 
<laughs> that's the that's the mechanism of addiction and people do get addicted to foods i think everybody can sort of spot addiction to coffee you know you drink coffee you drink coffee and if you go two hours without a cup you get a headache you say oh my god i need another coffee that's a food allergy uh, working as an addiction and it's a very common mechanism so the, the hidden allergy or mass the allergy phenomenon is what made it difficult to actually un uncover this process but now we understand it the key is to go without food. You can't, uh, you know, say, well, I wonder if I'm allergic to wheat. So I'll all wheat and see what happens. Doesn't work. Do Dr. Doris Rapp, dear sweet lady, a, a retired pediatrician on the USA, a lovely girl. She used to talk about the eight nails. Sorry, I'm trying to get this far enough away from the camera. That's it. Eight nails in the shoe, sticking up in your shoe. Well, you know, if you, if you pull out just one or two of the nails, say, you, you know, you've still got three nails. You're still going to limp. So you've still got your symptoms. You need to get all eight nails, or I should say five nails. I perhaps ought to modify my language for the next time I demonstrate that. <laughs> but, you know, the eight nails in the shoe trap means you've got to give up enough foods. Now, the ultimate, of course, is a fast. Just don't eat. If the symptoms go away, it was a food allergy. Reintroduce them one at a time and figure out which ones. And that's hard going, sometimes not quite recommended. But you, we do, we tend to use what's called an elimination diet. You know, we miss out the likely culprits. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, well, it's not funny because it's nature again, but the best elimination diet is what nature invented for us. The caveman diet, the stone age or paleolithic diet, the hunter-gatherer diet, so meats, fish, fruits, vegetables, uh, water, these, these are the common, common safe foods. Now, nothing is 100%, as I said, I told you about a child who was made violently ill by carrot. There are people who are allergic to meats, but by far the majority of trouble foods are the, what I call farmer foods. We've only, you know, we've only been farmers for about 10,000 years in terms of evolution. That's just the bat of an eye, really. Uh, and the farmer foods, of course, are, you know, cows, so dairy, milk products, cheese, butter, all those kind of things, eggs. Uh, the grains are the worst by far. So wheat, corn, barley, rice, oats. Uh, these tend to be the offending foods. And of course, manufactured foods. Once you start adding sugar and alcohol tea and coffee you're, you're in you're in trouble <laughs> these are definitely not natural foods so we what so it's playing a game sanjay you know you miss out the likely culprits and see what happens and as i say in the book there's only three things can happen you feel better you feel worse or you feel just the same uh, if you feel better it's great because it means you've given up significant allergy foods and the correct way proceed is do what we call challenge tests that's one food at a time bring them back i, I can't tell you the number of people historically I mean, they go on a they, they go on a fast and they feel wonderful and connected to god and i've never felt so youthful and clear-eyed and you know sharp in the mind and then they go back to the ice cream the pizza the donut, all at once coffee tea sugar few. <laughs> uh, and when you say well what were the offending foods they say oh, i don't know <laughs> So that's a common folly. I mean, if you feel good after giving up certain foods, you want to know which foods, surely. You know, they're not all going to be offenders. Yes. So yes. anyway, we call that elimination and challenge dieting. Uh, and if you feel worse, it's not necessarily bad news. You know, if you change your diet to the caveman diet and, and feel a bit worse, then it's probably something you're eating more of. You know, maybe you're now eating much more meat than usual or far more fruits or vegetables. And I have to emphasize again, Sanjay, anything can do it. I had a, a top doctor in Manchester once who came in with migraines. And long story short, we showed it was apples. He ate five or six apples a day, apple a day and all that story. He said, I can't believe it. Anyway, he, his migraines were gone. He had an apple allergy. About three months later, he phoned me, said, the migraines are back. What should I do, doctor? I said, are you back eating apples? He said, well, yes. I, I, you know, I don't think they could have been causing the problem. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was. I made him give up apples again, and his migraine went away forever. But, you know, anything can do it. You wouldn't think apple a day keeps the doctor away. could be a cause of severe, incapacitating migraine at least two or three times a month. But that's the way it goes. Uh, I'm trying, talking fast, Sanjay, trying to get in as much as we can. 
fact, in your in you you talked about this migraine problem also in the in your book Fire in the Belly, which talks mm. of the systemic inflammation, and you capture that so nicely over there in in terms of explanation of how the the consistent systemic inflammation will cause migraines and 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 things like that. Yes. Well, you know, I'm not trying to say everything is a food allergy, Sanjay, but it's a good place to start. Because if you're allergic to one of the common foods you're eating every day, the quicker you stop, the better. And it may be on its own sufficient. Remember I talked about load. So, you know, you give up dairy, boom, the load drops, all the migraines go, you're fine. You know, you may have been allergic to six more foods. But by giving up one, the load drops. It's a Scott be saying, Sanjay, you don't need zero allergies to get zero symptoms. You just have to come back to within the body's tolerance per emitter. And that's really back to the overload of body burden phenomenon, basically. Yes, yes, absolutely. You have been actually also uh, called the alternative doctor and have exposed a lot of uh, the little known secrets of uh, building body hacks to, to balance and build resilient immunity. Could you, right. I know it's very hard to say it in such short word, but if you can just give us a couple of hints to, or share some of the wisdom that you have uh, shared in the book. Uh, right. Well, I'm, I'm right in line with, you know, the Ayurvedic tradition and others. I believe in nature. Nature has the answer to everything. Doctors, you know, that think they cure things, they're just being arrogant. They never cure nothing. <laughs> nature cures it. The best a doctor can do is get rid of the, the barriers in the way, right? They take away the problem, then nature will fix it. Sometimes, uh, you know, she, she fixes it on her own. So you, you have to, I, I've forgotten the question, Sanjay, I'm sorry, remind me. <laughs> Early Alzheimer's or it's just, I need another coffee, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've written this uh, wonderful, uh, you know. Oh, you, systemic inflammation, wasn't it? No, no, it was not, it was but, being called an alternative doctor because you have developed. Oh, 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 oh I see the, old, yes, of course, yeah. Uh, well. Uh, Whatever I do, you know, I, I try and do it nature's way. And if you, if you en enlist nature's aid, she will help you. So the idea that coming at a person with, you know, strange chemicals is going to cure anything or cutting away pieces, you know, is the way to go. Unfortunately, none of that is really resolves the issues. You know, what we need to do is take away the problems. And that's, again, that's back to body burden. Now, some of the most important burdens, I've already done food at great length. I'm not going to do it again. But chemicals, you know, we haven't mentioned those, Sanjay, but there are millions of xenobiotic, as they're called, chemicals. That means not natural. You don't find them anywhere in nature, of which 70 or 80,000 are in production at any one time. And it's, a, it's an increasing burden. You know, when, when we criticize, as we do, you know, Syngenta and Monsanto and these people, they always try and pretend to be sanctimonious and, oh, well, you know, we're reducing the recommendations and we're putting less uh, poisons on the land every year. It's baloney. <laughs> it's cumulative, you know, so that adding last year's to this year's, it doesn't matter if it's a tenth of last year's. It's yes. still add to last year's, the year before, the year before that, go back 50 years. There's 50, 70 years of chemicals in the groundwater system. So if they stopped completely tomorrow, it's not going to go away. And obviously they're not going to stop completely tomorrow. So we're, we're facing this burden. And of course, there's another tremendous burden that people are very aware of now. Uh, I just finished interviewing a guy a few days ago as an expert in this, but electromagnetic forces or electrical fields, uh, you know, everyone knows that cell phones are dangerous, but you know, even the electrical wiring in the home, it can carry dirty electricity, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all it's coming at us in a storm. And of course, that's just another body burden. We can't go back to medieval times, but you know, there's enough science to say this is definitely a problem. And if you do this, you'll mitigate the problem. So, you know, uh, cell phones are a problem, but people should know to put it on aircraft mode at night, you know, just to turn the ringer off, put, uh, put it on aircraft mode or switch it off is even better. Or some people have taken to putting it in a tin can. You know, you just put the whole phone in, uh, in the can, close the lid. Nobody can call you, but you don't want to call in the middle of the night. So for eight hours a day, peace and quiet. I, I'm terrified. My granddaughter goes to sleep with this damn thing on her pillow. Poor thing. What on earth is she doing? 
uh, you know, she's only 20 now, but this is what all the kids are doing. You know, they text, uh, Facebook each other all night long, and then you just gradually fall asleep with a thing working on right next to their head. Oh, my God, it's terrible. So, you know, for every problem, there is something you can do to, re you know, improve it. Like, you know, this is a laptop, so I've got wife, I have no choice. I mean, somebody else's environment. But at home, we have a hard wire e Ethernet cable coming into the computer so that we don't need Wi-Fi. And so simple things like this, you know, can, and it's like stop eating a bad food, stop eating, you know, stop soaking yourself in the EMFs you don't want. And all these secrets exist, but the one that we've hardly met, you keep mentioning it, so I know you want me to talk is the microbiome has emerged like back in the 70s 80s we were talking about dysbiosis which is just a funny word meaning you know you've got you've got germs are screwed up but it's advanced and advanced and advanced until now we understand that that's probably the number one health factor it affects obesity you know if you're a, a microbiome screwed up you're going to be overweight you're going to be diabetic it affects inflammation as we were saying systemic inflammation uh, oh, we didn't even mention psychology. We're worried about, you know, the fear and stress on people. But, you know, the number one provoker of psych uh, psychological troubles is the microbiome. Anything from extreme schizophrenia to mild anxiety and neurosis states, this is often coming from the microbiome. You know, I've taught people to talk to their microbiome, Sanjay. You love this, I'm sure. But, you know, you can sit and talk, say, hey, you guys down there. You know, how did that go, that ice cream? It wasn't so good, was it? We won't do any more of that. Uh, and, you, you know, you get a definite feeling going in your body. If you're white, this is body-wise, right? It's intelligent-wise. Oh, if it's not, all the Ayurvedic people know this. <laughs> and quite a few Westerners, I might say. I don't know if you've read room. John Upledge's book where you actually talk to your body cells and they'll talk back. They will. Yes. You've talked about this in your punk psychology book, you know, the, the way. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, a dialogue with your organs. Hello, yes. liver. <laughs> what did I do wrong last week? <laughs> All right, I'll try and behave this week. <laughs> but it's funny, you will get an answer. You know, that you can talk to anything. So you can talk to stones, bricks, walls, trees. The whole, my ultimate position is that the whole universe is conscious. I believe that consciousness came first. I believe you'd share the same model and that the physical world appeared after that. Therefore, the physical world is inside consciousness, not the other way around. So there's no part of the physical that isn't conscious. And the idea that you can't talk to atoms because they're too tiny, they don't have brains. It's baloney. Of course you can talk to atoms. <laughs> You're part of the same stream of consciousness. Uh, anyway, this is going a bit far, isn't it? But uh, anyway, our retreats in our retreat center will be taking medicine to this level. Trust me. The <laughs> answers are actually not to be found in science, like you talked about in your book uh, Beyond Medicine, and the answers where you challenged actually physics and biology and the laws of physics. Uh, the answers are are, are beyond uh, beyond the laws of. Physics. Well, I said beyond the everyday laws. In fact. You know, advanced physics said all of the, not just that these funny things like remote viewing and telepathy could happen, advanced physics said they must happen because that's the whole structure and nature of the world. When I'm sarcastic and say this is beyond physics, I mean beyond the baloney physics that's being taught. You know, we're all machines, we're all mechanical things. There is no free will, there's no predetermination. You can clearly react numbers and chance. What kind of explanation for life is that, you know? Uh, I mean, and the same people, of course, try and say there's no such thing as God or what you're talking about. No, there's no such thing as random chance governing life. And, and Erwin Schrodinger, you know, the, 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 the physics pioneer, the quantum physics, negative entropy, you know, that life is beating entropy, whereas the whole physical universe is running down, life is going upwards. Uh, you know, life shouldn't be according to physics. You can't evolve something more complex than there is because that's contrary to entropy. And you know that second, second law of thermodynamics can never be questioned. 
Well, I'm pleased to say I can question it, and I'm happy to do so. But, you know, Rupert Sheldrake's now on board, and he's quite funny, isn't he? <laughs> uh, you know, are they laws of physics? I think they're just habits of the physical space around you. You can change them like you change any habit. <laughs> yes. no, that's absolutely no. In fact, this was Max Planck, wasn't it? The founder of quantum physics that said, we're absolutely not, ju just because something's happening, we're absolutely not justified in saying that this could be a law of physics how would we know you know at that point we hadn't been off the earth so you might go to the moon and find that physics isn't the same well so far it's checking out but you know we haven't been to a billion squillion trillion or 10 followed by 150,000 naughts worth of the total universe so how would we know their laws you know <laughs> listen this is going off track i'm sorry <laughs> but i love this kind of conversation with you Sanjay. this yeah, is what okay. i enjoy this conversation. Oh, yeah. I'm actually looking forward to your next visit to india as soon as these uh, conditions and these 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 uh, laws are changed for travel and and you are able to come i would like to welcome you to india i really i'm grateful for your time thank you so much for for sparing your time and giving us your valuable advice really really appreciate it I extend my invitation to you and Vivian to come to India and visit us and spread this whole thing around uh, the country and, and of course the whole world. You are, you are now traveling to Europe and spreading this knowledge and making this beautiful resort which I'm 100% sure really many, many people wanted to visit. I think so. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Sanjay. Thanks for having the patience to listen to me sounding off when I get going. I can't stop. <laughs> I love it. All right. Take care. God bless. Bye. Thank you so much.